Hello, I am Malus Peters and I've worked with molecular imprinted polymers since my PhD. So in this video I would like to talk about the rational design of molecular imprinted polymers. So what can you do rather than just experimentally starting in the lab and using a random combination of monomers or using metacrylic acid which is quite like a standard monomer used in MIP synthesis. Well first let's have a brief recap of what molecular imprinted polymers are. So in essence, it means that you start off with a template or a target molecule, you assemble functional monomers around it that can interact via a range of non-covalent interactions, such as for instance hydrogen bonds or ionic interactions, then we polymerize it, so we lock it into place into a 3D matrix, and then we finally extract the target. So what you end up with are porous structures that contain high affinity binding sites uh, that can mimic actually the affinity of natural antibodies. What has been well established is that the final affinity is governed by the pre-polymerization complex. So that's the complex that you get when you have your target and then you have the monomers assembling around it in the beginning. But bear in mind that unlike in uh, when we are using amino acids or proteins, we only have around 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Whereas when you work with polymers, you have an infinite library of building blocks or monomers that you can use. So it's very important knowing up front what the best combination of monomers is and also what the ratio of it is. And I will tell you generally you would definitely need more than just one functional monomer because you would expect the monomers to anchor onto different binding sites and that's the key to achieving selectivity. Now, luckily for us this process is very flexible so it's versatile and can be adapted from things from really small compounds to even ions and small organic compounds all the way down to whole bacteria and cells. There's also a useful database so you can have a look at mipdatabase.com where you can search for templates to see what other people have already done in the area. So what are the things to consider here? I mentioned before we have natural proteins composed of these amino acids which have very very defined sequences been optimized by millions of years of evolution uh, and they are stabilized uh, by weak bonds. So it also means that these antibodies typically tend to work only in very specific conditions if that's in our body and typically we are around 37 degrees and pH 7.4 uh, unless you're looking at for instance in your stomach. So it means that these uh, antibodies only work in a very defined range. On the other hand, if we work with molecularly imprinted polymers, and please note there are other synthetic receptors that you might use, such as for instance aptamers, we don't have a million and million of years uh, of evolution. So we need to compete with that with other strategies. Um, so for instance, computational modeling and analytical techniques can be used to optimize your process. We can uh, define the sequence of the polymers, but generally it's not as controlled as you would find in nature. Uh, and you can use different types of architectures. So the advantage is that you can work with layers, you can work with nanoparticles, so you have a lot of options. But one of the key advantages is that the system is really robust due to its cross-linked nature. So it means that you can actually expose these materials to extreme environments such as high pH or, or high temperature and then they would still work. Now nowadays there are several approaches that have been developed that have really increased the affinity of uh, these molecular imprinted polymers. And one of these examples is using a solid phase imprinting approach to produce nanoparticles, on which I've done a previous video to show how this works. But just to give you an idea of how this typically works, uh, we work with a range of monomers, typically acrylamide based, uh, and then can be, for instance, if you wanted to look at hydrophobic interactions, they can have like a tertiary butyl group. So these acrylamides are adapted in order to govern different non-covalent interactions. The particles, when you use this solid phase approach, we typically use NIPAN, which swells, and we use that in order to use a series of temperature illusions to get the best high affinity materials. Um, so it does mean uh, that there's quite a range in size. So whether you would look at solution or in the dry state, you will see there's a difference in how the materials behave. Uh, but typically there would be anywhere, let's say between 50 and 150 nanometer. And you can very clearly see is that they're spherical in size. And if you wanted to use these materials for, for instance, sensing or for drug delivery, one of the big advantages when working with these molecularly imprinted polymers is that can we embed extra functionality in there. So we can use things as such as, for instance, optical probes. Uh, fluorescein is commonly used. We can use rhodamine 
or we can add in other redox probes, such as, for instance, ferrocene, in order to give different functionality in the material. And this is another big advantage uh, compared to, for instance, natural receptors. So you can easily modify these materials. And typically this is done with an EDC-NHS coupling, uh, because these materials do contain uh, carboxylic acids and amine groups. So what tools do we have available to optimize the affinity? It's spread out into different things. So first of all, I said we, we start off with the template, but when you're working with a protein, you probably don't necessarily start with the full protein uh, because that usually has limited stability and it's far too expensive to use in large quantity. So what people tend to do is that they work with an epitope of the protein. So the first thing that you might want to consider is what is the epitope that I'm going to use because that in itself can be quite complex. So in order to do this, you can search via literature and you can have a look and see what's available. And there's also other uh, approaches available which are more high throughput, uh, such as, for instance, the company MIP Discovery offers an epitope discovery service where they bind uh, these materials with uh, parts of the protein. And then afterwards, they look what epitopes are available via LCMS. So the length of this epitope is also very important. If you work with typically, let's say, 10 to 15 amino acids, we know we are working with a linear sequence. However, the protein will always have like a complicated 3D structure. So the question is, is it better to work with a short linear sequence, what people typically tend to do? Or would it be better to work with a longer sequence, where we start to embed some kind of 3D structure in there? Because that might be more representative of what the protein actually looks like. And there's still an ongoing search in this area, but also the emphasis has got to be on the cost. And because you will see as soon as you start to go above 20 amino acids, the cost will increase dramatically. So then there are the analytical techniques to look at the monomer composition. So not just the composition, but perhaps also the ratio, which can equally be important. Because the ratio between your functional monomer and your crosslinker monomer can also uh, have a big influence on the properties. The disadvantage here is obviously that you have to have the materials available. You don't need to work with the polymer. People typically just use the monomers and expose it to different concentrations of the template. And well-established techniques in that area include NMR and ITC. Uh, typically, if you have a hydrogen bond, you can very easily see the shift using NMR. And ITC is also a very good technique in order to work out what the optimal ratio is and what monomers bind best. Not so common, but there's also been examples where infrared spectroscopy has been used. The main disadvantage of all of these is that none of them are really high throughput. Um, but there are some reports in using pseudo type of ELISA assays where essentially you would swap out the antibodies with these polymer alternatives. And this you can do on a 96 well plate, so the screening for that would go a lot faster. Um, and here you would have to attach uh, something like HRP to the template, so in order to give you that optical detection signal that you're looking for. Alternatively, in some cases, if your template has a very defined functional group, such as an amine group, you can also use that in order to screen for which monomers perform the best. All of this still implies that you need to do quite a significant amount of lab work. So what they tend to say is even a few hours of modeling can save you weeks in the lab. And that's definitely the case for computational modeling, which is more and more used in order to design the best systems uh, for your MIP synthesis. Here again, you look at the pre-polymerization complex and you look at the binding energy between uh, having your monomer attached to the templates, which is called the adduct. And then you subtract that uh, from uh, the energy of the monomer and of the template itself. So the more negative this, this binding energy, or EB, is, the more stable your complex is. So that seems to imply that you would have a better affinity overall at the end. What you need to do is here, you first of all need to put your monomer or your epitope, depending on what you work with, put that in your system, and then figure out where binding occurs. Well, sometimes you would have to use some common sense for it. For instance, if you work with a carboxylic acid, you know this is likely to bind to an amine group. Um, so you would first need to identify the binding sites that there are on your molecule and then you need to optimize the binding between them. So that means the length uh, and the angle at which it binds. And then finally you can run, run calculations in order to get these EB values. So we've established a protocol for this, but there's nothing actually that's been automated in, in literature. 
Uh, so people do routinely do this, but there's a couple of different experimental methods that you can use for this. And generally, even though there are some examples of this, uh, people don't consider the solvent or the crosslinker monomer. You can, but obviously this implies some extra complexity to the system. But what this uh, also allows you to do is to look at the selectivity. For instance, here you can see an example where we looked at levodopa, a small molecule, and one of the things that we picked up in our experimental results is that the binding was almost exactly the same of levodopa versus dopamine. And what you can see here, these two molecules are very similar in composition, and uh, they both have two hydroxy groups on the benzene ring. And what we found out is that the monomer that we used in this case is was aniline, bound at exactly the same place of these two templates, but also with very similar binding energy. So equally so, your computational modeling uh, can be used to not only predict which monomers are the best, but to also give you an indication of selectivity. Because in most cases, not all, you want to achieve very selective binding. One of the key things you see more and more of is obviously machine learning. So can we apply this to molecular imprinting as well? So to date, I only found one paper on that, which didn't go into very much detail. And I think there's a very good reason why this has not been widely applied yet. First of all, even though there are some automated reactors in literature for this solid phase imprinting approach, here I've given you an example, one where we use APS TMET for initiation and another one which is a photoreactor. Typically, these uh, reactors cannot produce more than a few milligrams at a time. The yield is overall also quite low, around 5 to 10 percent, so it means that this is not a very scalable approach, and particularly for a photoreactor, you can encounter problems around having thermal hotspots. The mixing can also be a considerable problem, and we don't really know very well what actually uh, influences the overall yield, even though we could use something like UV-Vis at around 200 nanometer in order to work out what the yield is. So the polymerization uh, mechanism is generally not that very well understood when you work with a solid phase, um, so you would need to have more insight into the kinetics over time to see how long it actually takes in order to get your optimal sequence. And then, as mentioned in the previous slide, there is also a lack of high throughput screening protocols. So in essence, high throughput, both production and screening and insights in the polymerization, all of that is actually required to have the data to which we can apply machine learning. So where do we go next from here? So hopefully you will know that these nanoparticles can definitely compete with natural receptors in terms of affinity. You can go to Sigma Aldrich and you find some commercial examples, which is mainly based on microparticles for purification and extraction. However, for sensing, this is lagging behind somewhat, and part of it is because we don't really have a good method to design these materials, which I talked about in this presentation, but there's also not a good way to uh, implement them in a very high scale into ready-made sensors. So there are some challenges around the polymer synthesis, so around the scalability, the reproducibility of the materials. And the second is that we need to look at more analytical tools in order to facilitate high throughput screening. And then finally, I think that computational modeling has a very, very important role in all of this. So this is not just to optimize nanomip synthesis conditions, it's also selecting the optimal targets or the optimal epitopes to work with. And then it's also designing the optimal monomer compositions. So in essence, if we really want to compete with antibodies, we need automated processes or protocols uh, to make sure that we can very rapidly determine high affinity materials. Thanks for watching, and if you do want to know more about molecular imprinting in general, then do have a look at this playlist by our inspired materials.